Hey guys, this is Nick and here is your roundup of April's Linux and open source news you might have missed. As always, I'll add links relative to each new thing in the description, check them out for more detail. April 8th. Microsoft released their Chromium-based version of Edge, or at least the first preview of it. Those of you that followed me for a bit know what I think about an all Chromium-based web, but at least it will make sure that people using Windows have a capable default browser that works well with most websites. We'll have to see how that impacts the global web ecosystem though, since I feel that too much reliance on one browser engine can only be a bad thing. Check out the video in the top right corner if you want to know more about how I feel about this issue. Also of note is that Microsoft said they are focusing on Windows 10 for now, but a Linux port isn't totally out of the equation. Not that I'd use it. April 9th. Blackmagic Design has announced the DaVinci Resolve beta for its version 16. This beta is available for Mac, Windows, and of course Linux, and brings a lot of improvements, including a new cut page to simplify the basic editing and the timeline, while retaining the power of the older editing style, the Fusion and Fairlight tab, and its powerful color correction tools. DaVinci Resolve unfortunately doesn't work for me on my AMD machine, and version 16 doesn't change that, but for people who can use it, it's definitely one of the best choices out there on Linux if you're not against proprietary software. Opera also announced its Reborn 3 new browser, with a crypto wallet included out of the box. They actually took the position of anti-Google champion here, releasing a short sci-fi film and aiming to bring about the web version 3, where decentralized applications, or blockchain-enabled apps, can help breaking the hold of bigger companies on the open web. While I applaud the initiative, I think it's still a bit of a marketing gimmick, and since Opera is based on Chromium, it's actually a bit weird. Firefox has added some crypto mining protection to its beta releases. The goal is to avoid being crypto jacked when browsing in Firefox, since some websites tend to use JS miners to use your CPU to mine some sweet crypto without your knowledge. This protection is obviously a good thing and will be turned on in Firefox 68 when it releases. Fingerprinting protection will also be added, avoiding websites making a precise snapshot of your hardware and preventing them to track you across the web without your consent. April 10th. Unless you're living in one, you probably know that NASA managed to take a picture of a black hole, which is by no means a small achievement since these things don't emit or bounce light back. Well, this blurry picture would not have been possible without open source software. Two of the libraries used are in fact open source, namely SparseLab and EHTIM, and are distributed under the GPLv3. April 12th. Wine 4.6 was released with notable improvements, such as a new backend for Wine Direct 3D using Vulkan. Some games running on Wine or Proton required the use of Wine D3D, which performance was far lower than using DXVK. With this new backend, performance should, when it's fully implemented, reach acceptable frame rates on these games as well. April 13th. Firefox announced a recommended extensions program, which is, in essence, a selection of curated extensions for Firefox that meet certain standards of security and user experience. They will be featured prominently in the add-ons portal of Firefox, and generally recommended to users visiting these pages. While I agree that this kind of program is needed to make sure users are faced with some really secure and good extensions, I also hope it won't turn into some kind of sponsorship or ad program. April 15. DXVK 1.0.3 has been released. While it's still not the big 1.1 update that got pulled recently because of performance problems, it still brings a few enhancements, especially to the shader cache. It should also have fixes for Dark Souls Remastered, Grim Dawn, Anno 1800 and Star Citizen. April 17. Steam also released a new version of its client for Linux, which most notably fixes the mouse cursor not showing up in the Steam overlay on some Proton games, and improves support for Steam library on NTFS partitions, which should make it easier to share a partition between Windows and Linux to play games, although I would still not recommend doing so. For those who follow the latest iteration of these news, Valve is basically publishing the beta version from last month. April 18th. Ubuntu 19.04, codenamed Disco Dingo, and its myriad of variants have been released. The main GNOME version brings performance improvements, updated versions of Firefox, Thunderbird, LibreOffice, and the new kernel version should enable more hardware and more performance out of the box. It also brings back desktop icons by default, although with a limited feature set. 
Variants include Kubuntu with KDE 5.15, Xubuntu, which now ships GIMP and LibreOffice Impress by default, and tons of improvements to the default apps, or Ubuntu Mate, which will stick to Mate 1.20 and wait 6 months before using Mate 1.22. Ubuntu Budgie, Lubuntu, and Ubuntu Studio now saw new releases, with the latter having support for installing optional packages even after the regular installation. Check out my dedicated video on that new release for a detailed rundown. The KDE community released the KDE Applications 19.04. While most applications have received significant upgrades, the highlights are Dolphin, which gains a lot of new thumbnail capabilities and better tag management, and Gwenview, the image viewer, which gains touchscreen support. In the same vein, Pop OS 19.04, System 76's Ubuntu-based OS, has been released as well. Using GNOME 3.32 with a custom theme and extensions, Pop OS 19.04 brings a slim mode to reduce the size of the header bars and title bars, as well as a dark mode. New installations also get the option to refresh their install from their recovery partition, reinstalling the OS without losing data in your home directory. PopOS also refreshed its icon theme to be more in line with the latest GNOME 3.32 icons and benefits from much of the under-the-hood goodies enjoyed by Ubuntu 19.04. Existing users can upgrade to 19.04 and new users willing to try it out can download it from System76's website. April 19th Steam Play got two new releases, one to update the oldest version of Proton to 3.16-9 and another one to release version 4.2-3. This version includes Wine Mono, which is a .NET XNA implementation and should allow a few launchers and games to work out of the box, such as Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm 4 or the Warframe launcher and updater. DXVK got bumped to 1.0.3 and FAudio got a version update as well, whose numbering scheme is far too complex to be said out loud. As always, you can get these new versions directly from Steam. April 22nd Kdenlive officially announced its next new release, Kdenlive 19.04. While it's part of the KDE software compilation, it deserved a separate announcement. Among the new stuff is an automatic split of audio and video on dedicated tracks, as well as keyboard navigation for moving clips and keyframes and the ability to resize tracks individually. The preview is now hardware accelerated, which means it is a lot smoother and faster to work with and the Cut tool can now show a preview of the frame when you're cutting by pressing Shift. Rendering can now be hardware accelerated as well, but this feature is still experimental. This version is the first step of the whole refactor of Caden Live and will allow the team to focus on better stability, more professional editing tools, and a complete revamp of the title creation tool. This is exciting news and I can't wait to see what they release next. SuperTux Kart also finally reached its 1.0 version. The karting game has been around forever, but this version adds a ton of new stuff. You can now play it online with friends, on new tracks and new game modes. The game used to look terrible, but its graphics have been improved quite a lot, and it's now a very fun and capable Mario Kart-like game. You can download it and try it for yourself. April 24th the GNOME developers are looking to create a hardware diagnostics tool, in the same vein as what Apple includes in macOS 10. The goal is to have a complete technical rundown of all your hardware and firmware, as well as allowing to block certain firmware versions. This tool would be a very useful piece of software for debugging and for getting help online. The GNOME team is currently looking for a design, and to know which info should be shown and which should be hidden. It's still only a discussion though, so don't get too excited. April 27th. Wine 4.7 was released with 34 bugs fixed and an updated mono engine. This bi-weekly release schedule is really fantastic and the Wine team is really pushing the boundaries on what's possible without emulation. I still can't really get it into my head that these are completely binary incompatible programs running on a system they were never designed for. April 28th. DeepN 15.10 was released, bringing a lot of enhancements to its desktop. Highlights include a Stacks feature to automatically group files by type on your desktop, the ability to set a slideshow of images as your wallpaper, improved customization of sound effects with the ability to turn each sound effect on or off individually, and a ton of bug fixes. The distro is now built on Debian Stable to allow better stability. This version is recommended to all current Deepin users, and I have a dedicated video on the channel if you want to check out what's new. 
April 30th. Fedora 30 was released, bringing a vanilla GNOME 3.32 with all the entails, major performance improvements in animations on the shell, the new Advaita theme and icons, and a lot of nice touches on the settings, including a dedicated panel for each application to manage their disk space and even their permissions in the case of Flatpak applications. DNF, the package manager, also has seen performance improvements, and Fedora now allow users to install the Pentheon and Dpin desktop environments if they like these. I already have a dedicated video on Fedora 3.30, don't hesitate to check it out if you want to learn everything new about this. Finally, Purism, the company that makes privacy and free software focused laptops, and soon a phone, announced the Librem 1 suite of apps. The goal is simple, to remove as much privacy invasive stuff from your life as possible, including mostly Google services. The suite includes, for now, Librem Chat, a matrix based chat app, with video calling and totally encrypted, Librem Mail, an encrypted email account and client, Librem Tunnel, a VPN app, and Librem Social, a social network client that seems based on Mastodon. A backing model is also available to get access to a file hosting service, a cloud backup solution, a contact seeking service, as well as an encrypted payment solution and a pay-as-you-go calling solution. You can access all available services now, starting from $8 a month, with discounts being applied for longer-term engagement. Cheaper plans allow you to pick only certain services if the whole suite is too much for you. As you might know, I'm concerned with online privacy, and Librem has proven that it's, for now at least, an ethical company. I'll probably try out the various apps as soon as I can to see how they stack up against other solutions. The apps are already on Android and iOS, and will soon be available on the Librem Store, which is the shared app store from PureOS, the Linux-based distro that runs Librem's laptops and future phone. So that's it for our Linux and open source news roundup for April. I hope you guys enjoyed, and let me know in the comments if I missed anything, and I'll see you in the next one in May. Bye! If you enjoyed, please consider liking, subscribing, and turning on notifications. You can also follow me on Twitter at the Linux EXP. Thank you guys for watching, and goodbye!